everybody, and welcome to the Menorah Podcast Ministry. Um, we are so thankful that you have decided to come and to join us today. And uh, this is our seventh episode, Alan. It is hard to believe already. It is. And uh, we have seen uh, this podcast ministry grow already in some awesome ways. And just want to thank you for tuning in, sharing with your friends. And uh, today is Thursday, March the 14th of 2024. So that means that this is our second pastor profile. On the second Thursday of every month, we're going to do a profile of a pastor that has already been called to heaven. And uh, Alan, you might remember last time we did Dr. Uh, R.G. Lee, and uh, I think our listeners really enjoyed that. I agree. Um, Heard some positive feedback. I did too. Uh, One thing that I heard from folks that was interesting is is they didn't realize that uh, he was brought up in a sharecropper family. And uh, I think a lot of people enjoyed your personal testimony of of what that was like uh, from your parents being in that uh, situation. So let's talk about uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers today. Uh, if you're listening and if you've been in church for any length of time, odds are you've probably heard of Dr. Adrian Rogers before. Alan, what do you know about him before we get into it? I know of him. Um, I don't know a lot about him. Uh, you know, we kind of were more in a, uh, a rural setting as I grew up, I guess probably in the last 15 to 20 years, uh, Gaston's really become more of a uh, metropolitan area or, uh, I guess, a suburban area. Yeah, of, suburban, yeah. Of uh, Columbia. So, you know, information's a lot freer. Uh, we all carry around a wealth of information in our hands and our pockets at most time. And, uh, you know, now if you're in a conversation and somebody asks you about something, you can whip that uh, device out and, and, and Google it real quick. And find out. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about him. He was Dr. Adrian Rogers, was born on September the 12th of 1931, so uh, at the beginning of the Depression. And he was born in West Palm Beach, Florida. And he began his pastoral ministry at the age of 19. So he started young in the ministry. And for his undergrad, he graduated from Stetson University in Deland, Florida, uh, with a Bachelor's of Arts. And then he went on to the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and earned a Bachelor's of Divinity in 1958. He was then ordained by the Northwood Baptist Church and West Palm Beach. So he's a Florida boy. And uh, I, I think what's really interesting, um, just to kind of point out, he was a young pastor. I can relate to that. Uh, But also, you know, he was educated. You see, uh, you know, his education there and that he cared a lot about that. And so any any thoughts you have on his background before we move on to his three pastorates? Well, I was just, you know, as I was looking at this uh, sheet, it it did strike me as that he started out pretty young. Um, You know, it seems to me that um, a lot of uh, folks are called into the ministry pretty young. Uh, most of my experience with pastors is, you know, that they were really called young. Mm-hmm. And when God reached out to them, uh, some of them delayed that process. Uh, some of them started preparing right away. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's a good observation. Um, and in Dr. Adrian Rogers' day, there was a lot more younger preachers than there are now. Um, I think our listeners know there's a huge shortage right now. I mean, honestly, there's a shortage of everything uh, from what they tell us in the media. But from a pastor's perspective, you know, the average age of a pastor in the Southern Baptist Convention is around 60 to 61. That's not good. Um, we have more retiring than we have coming in. But in Adrian Rogers' day, it was definitely an interesting component where a lot of the guys were young and, and wanted to start. So uh, looking at his pastorates, his first church, uh, he was very young, right out of seminary. Uh, his very first pastorate uh, was at the Felsmere Baptist Church, and that is in Florida, and that is a really small church. Um, I tried to find out if they had a website. They still exist. They just don't have a website. So uh, they're extremely small. They're on the uh, church directory as far as Southern Baptist churches. Uh, when he was there, about 20 to 30 people. And uh, what I have been told uh, by people that have studied Adrian Rogers now 
this story that I was told was told orally. I haven't ever seen it written. Uh, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. But, but I was told one time by somebody that studies Dr. Adrian Rogers or studied that at his very first church, one of his uh, church members, I believe it was a deacon, I can't remember exactly, but came up to him after one of the services and said, hey, you probably need to go find something else to do. You're just not going to make it as a pastor. And uh, looking at what Adrian Rogers became, as we'll get into in just a few minutes, you know, that strikes me. But that just shows that people can be wrong. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that struck me is is um, how a church uh, in today's society doesn't have a website, at least a web <laughs> presence. You know, yeah. some of the even smaller churches have recognized uh, the ability of media to kind of... Uh, get their message out a little better well i think you remember when i first came here over three years ago now i'm on my fourth year what the website looked like it's kind of rough even just a few years ago but but we've made the changes and and things of that nature so during the time at his first church he hosted a radio program called daybreak he was on the radio back then radio was much more radio is really like what we're doing right now yeah um you know it's just how Media has evolved, and uh, that's what we'll talk about next week. But, um, yeah, so he had a radio program, and then he was called to his second church, which is First Baptist Church in Merritt Island, Florida. And uh, so still stays in Florida. And what's interesting about this is I looked at their website, and they're doing well. They're thriving. I think they have six or seven staff pastors and in addition to a senior pastor. And so he was there for eight years, really think that's where he – really got his uh, foundation, where he really got uh, his feet wet, and uh, all of those different things as far as that's concerned there. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's it's interesting that, you know, he jumped. Now, I don't know what the size of that church is. probably about 250 in those days, um, but I know it's a lot bigger now. Uh, but I think uh, what he's really known for um, is his third church. Uh, which was Bellevue uh, Baptist Church. And what's interesting for our listeners is that Bellevue Baptist Church uh, was also uh, the church where um, R.G. Lee served. And we talked about R.G. Lee last month. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of similarities between the two, but there's also a lot of differences. So let's talk about Bellevue. Bellevue Baptist Church is in Memphis, Tennessee. And he came there in 1972 and then retired in 2000. And five, and so uh, you know, just an incredible ministry that he had there. I think what's really interesting is that he and his wife didn't even want to go there. Uh, I know that they uh, preach. You know, he went and preached um, a a sermon there, but it wasn't necessarily a trial sermon. And uh, the church said, "Hey, we want you." He said, "No." He said, "No." He he continually told them no until God said, yeah, you need to go here. And so he went, and he went to Bellevue and was there a long time with his wife, Joyce, who was a big prominent part of his ministry. You can find all kind of stuff about uh, Adrian Rogers on Love Worth Finding website. That's a ministry. Uh, When Hannah and I go to the convention every year, there's a booth, uh, Love Worth Finding, which is the Adrian Rogers booth, and they give you a free backpack, free books, I mean, I have tons of books that he's written uh, from that ministry. So when he got to Bellevue in 1972, the membership was 9,000. I want you to think about that. That's, that's, a pretty big, that's a pretty big congregation. That's a lot of people. Definitely can't do it by yourself. And, and jumping from what he jumped from, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's huge. He went from First Baptist Merritt Island, which is, is a large church for that area, but I mean, you go from 300 and around 500, whatever the size was, to 9,000. That's uh, that's quite the jump. Yep. And so he did that, and by the time he retired in 2005, the church membership was at 29,000. Wow. So he obviously led the church, and, and I want all our listeners to know, a church does not grow because of the man. The church grows because of the uh, message that is brought out and that the Messiah is seen through the message and not in the man. 
And I think, you know, it's not about the man, it's about the Messiah and how he's seen in the message. And I think that's really important for our listeners to know that God's the only one who can anoint church growth. He's the only one that can allow it to happen, but then sustain it once it's there. Yeah, and that's really important. That's uh, one of the things that we don't want to to uh, forget as we um, are in our time of growth and uh, even even in a time of decline that that God can still work through any congregation, but we need to uh, always uh, take time to realize that it is through God that we grow. Yep. Absolutely, Alan. Absolutely. So his uh, his successor there was R.G. Lee. Um, which we talked about last month. And during his pastorate, uh, Adrian Rogers led the church to move into their mega church facility. And so uh, there's a lot of different things, articles that you can read online about that. He died at a young age. In my opinion, he died at a young age, 74. I think that's pretty young. Mm -hmm. And 2005. Now, one thing I do want to point out to our listeners, as far as pastors go, 74 is pretty old. Um, there's a lot of lot of uh, research that has been done about pastors and pastoral health. Most pastors die as soon as they retire. Um, my granddad died three or four years after he retired. I think I think that's a commonality. I mean, you know, and is it scary? I mean, you know, the Lord directs your steps. You know, the Lord has you. But I think because of the stress of the office, because of the workload of the office, I think over time that causes the bodies because pastors are people. And that does cause the body to deteriorate over time with that kind of stress and workload. Not necessarily saying that was Adrian Rogers' case, but I've seen that happen a lot. A lot of pastors don't live to be old. Uh, when I say old, I'm meaning late 80s, early 90s. Um, so let's talk about his legacy as we kind of wrap up the podcast today. Uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers was president of the Southern Baptist Convention from 1979 to 1980 and then was re-elected from 1986 to 1987. And when he ran for the presidency of the Southern Baptist Convention, he ran on the platform of biblical inerrancy, meaning that the Bible is without error, it is infallible, and errant is the inspired word of God. Now here's the important thing, is if he's having to run on that platform, that means there must be people that don't believe the Bible is inerrant. And that was indeed the case. In the 1970s and 1980s, the Southern Baptist Convention was struggling with liberalism. And I want our listeners to know that uh, the Southern Baptist Convention is the only mainstream denomination that drifted liberal, became liberal, but came all the way back to their conservative roots. We are the only mainstream denomination where we went liberal, but we came back. Um, every other denomination, you could look at Methodist, you could look at Episcopalian, you could look at Presbyterian. They've all drifted liberal, and they've stayed liberal. And I think one reason that we came back to the conservative side was because of people like Adrian Rogers, Paige Patterson, a lot of great heroes of the faith. Uh, but one thing that Dr. Adrian Rogers did that I really commend him for is that he uh, he pretty much demanded that uh, mandated that liberal and moderate seminary professors would be dismissed and that they would have to be replaced by conservative um, professors. So obviously that has helped our convention. Our convention mm -hmm. is still conservative. Uh, we still remain conservative from that resurgence. And I think that's one thing where when I see what Dr. Adrian Rogers did, I see other pastors when things go ways they don't agree with, instead of jumping out of the boat, why not stay in the boat and row? Why not stay in the boat and make it better? Imagine if Adrian Rogers left the convention because they went liberal instead of trying to help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the case a lot of times, um, even in local churches. I, I've been in this congregation for all of my life. And, of course, you know, while you're teenagers and things like that, you don't notice things as much. But, you know, it's easy sometimes for us um, to... Uh, I guess get mad and go home because we don't get our way or we don't think things are right rather than staying and working. And, you know, that's not really something that's biblical. Yeah, that's right. You know, Jesus doesn't say take your ball and go home. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Stay in the game. Dr. Rogers was also the chairman of the committee that produced the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. So, what we hold is our confession of mm -hmm. faith. He was the chairman of that, which is it's quite a pretty important fitting. document for us. I mean, 
incredibly important. Anytime we ordain somebody, we go through that. Anytime, yep. that's what we base our entire new members class upon here is the Baptist faith and message. And so I think the man that helped lead us back to the conservative promised land, so to speak, I think it's only fitting that he was the one that had a part in that. He's authored 18 books. And I looked at a website earlier today on um, their opinion of the top 10 Adrian Rogers sermons. You can find most of his sermons on Love Worth Finding on their YouTube channel. I encourage you to watch his messages. But these are the top 10 that they rank that maybe you could look at later today. How to get up when you're down is number one. Number two, when God cleans house. Number three, the signs of the times and the beginning of the end. Number four, how to handle temptation. Number five, standing firm in a pagan world. Number six, how to be successful. Number seven, the stars and scars of Christmas. Number eight, the battle for your mind. Number nine, the soul never, never dies. And number ten, why did Jesus choose Judas? So if you're looking for some sermons to listen to, I encourage you to look up some of those. So this has been our pastor profile. Alan, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, sir. I think it's uh, you did a re really outstanding job. Well, I think you did too. I think we'll keep you around. Ah, appreciate that. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening to Episode 7 of the Menorah Podcast. I want to remind you, the purpose of Menorah is to speak, share, and send the light of Jesus through podcast ministry. I want to invite you to listen to our episode next Thursday, Episode 8, Thursday, March the 21st. We'll be talking about marketing, media, and ministry. So we hope to see you then. Have a good one. Have a good one, guys.